for Dan, we would probably be maybe speaking to an empty room. So thank you so much. <laughs> I just made everyone else go away. <laughs> so, but truly, thank you for coming. Um, an author sphere is also in the author world. When you talk about book events, every author will be like, oh, there's that one that I drove through the snowstorm for an hour and a half and I showed up and one other person was there. And there's that weird jockeying of like, did I tell you to go home? Do I stay and have a one on one conversation? So we feel really lucky that we've had a lot of great conversations with people all over Southern California, yes. Chicago, Washington. Mm -hmm. So um, Asha, why don't you start with how we even ended up doing this whole journey together? Well, I guarantee you, this is not how most people do it because uh, we started out kind of by accident and definitely um, not in a trained way. Um, Allie's a finance and history major, and I made, I went to UC Berkeley, made up my own major. <laughs> <laughs> my, my parents just asked, can you make me doing that? <laughs> um, we were not creative writing or English majors at all. We both are 20 year teachers. Um, Allie is an administrator and a teacher, and I is a classroom teacher. Um, and we met at a small private school in Seattle. Um, working on the admissions team, we worked for a very, very proper Swiss German educator, the founder of our school. Very, very serious. <laughs> and when we met these three and four and five year old kids coming to uh, interview for our pre K and kindergarten classrooms, you know, we, we sort of were looking at them like, gosh, that one over there is not picking his nose. Let's pick him. <laughs> <laughs> it was very scientific. Very scientific. You got to the school. Or, Allie, um, if you make me take that kid who's wearing pull ups again, it's like, I'm not doing it. I'm quitting. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, but did you see this dad? <laughs> That's so cute. You could look at that all year. Hot dad goes to Trump. Kid in pull ups. <laughs> um, so we found this similar sense of humor after we went through all of the protocols of examining families and the kids and how they would fare at our school. We'd sneak down in my classroom where I always had something cooked in the fridge and Allie always wanted to eat something out of my fridge um, and laugh and laugh about the kids and laugh about the parents and how worried they were that this was the be all and end all of education for their child. Um, we were those parents. Our four children went to that school. We were those parents. So we were laughing at ourselves too. And we'd say, oh my gosh, just in jest. If I ever write a book, that story's going here. Oh no, if I write a book, this story's going in there. Well, years later, when I left the school and started my own uh, catering company, uh, Allie had left a couple years after that and went to found an international friend school, uh, dual language, Mandarin and English. Um, you know, we stayed in touch because I'm a cook. <laughs> so living in Seattle, she was finally around family. Oh my god, I'm so much better at this part of the story. We'll do it then. Yeah. <laughs> you did it last time. Why didn't you give it to me? Because it's my story. Okay, well, go ahead. <laughs> So I'm the only child. child. Did I mention that? <laughs> I'm the middle child. Did you see how easily I yes. did it? <laughs> so I lived for Kenya in San Francisco for 20 years. And my whole but my whole family is in Washington. And in those 20 years, my aunts and my mom assumed I must have learned to cook. And in those 20 years, I lived across from an amazing assortment of foods in San Francisco. I never really learned to cook, and I really never learned to cook for the Jewish high holidays or Passover. So we moved to see my husband and I, my um, first daughter, then we had our second, moved to Seattle, and I had this very open family layout of my house, and all of a sudden, it's never crossed my mind, my aunts and my mom decided you will now be the keeper of the holidays. You will now invite the whole family into your house and share 
your two year or your two decades of learning to be a Jewish cook with the whole family. And I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> so Asha had left to be start a catering company. A soul food catering <laughs> <laughs> But she was the only one I knew that was a phenomenal cook. So on Jewish holidays, I would call Asha up. And I'm like, you, you got to get this and this and this. And Asha would come over like 40 minutes before my whole family would come. We transfer it from her dishes into my dishes. We get it into the oven. We get it. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I actually have servingware. And Asha's like, really? I'm like, I do have that. We get out my servingware. Asha would even do my daughter's French braids. So they like presentable for her, their puppy. And Asha did it all. And then I throw her out the front door. And my family would arrive. And I'm like, Happy Passover! <laughs> Welcome! I'm an amazing Jewish cook now. <laughs> and that's how we stayed in touch after we both left the school. Okay, now you can take off. Um, where, where am I picking up? How we, st how we started oh, yeah. writing. So, Allie, this is also your story, but Allie was coming on the bus from Boise uh, to the Boise airport from Sun Valley <clears throat> on a visit. And recollecting a relationship she, that she had with a black female educator in San Francisco who was very dark skinned, but in this um, environment that was very pale colors, lots of yellows, beige, whites, and also, the people and the walls. also <laughs> surrounded by white families. She was holding the keys to the kingdom that they all wanted it into. And that's a very reversal of, mm -hmm. of positions. Um, and the uh, Looking on that scene, an idea popped into Ellie's head. Riding in that bus, she thought, hey, I got a story in my head. But when you're writing from the perspective of a black character as a white person, you you got to realize you might be able to give that general idea, that human perspective, but there are some specifics that could be missing. And she thought, who could write with me? Yeah. I'll get Asha to do it. <laughs> Who could write with me and feed me why we wrote? <laughs> Just to be clear. So Allie was my immediate boss and read that when we were uh, working at the school, we wrote narratives instead of grades. So it's, I mean, each subject, law narratives for every child. Um, so she knew I could write about kids and family. The only thing I knew about Allie is that she wrote a lot of emails as an administrator. I'm jumping on a lot of emails. Um, but she called me when she reached the, uh, no no cell service, so probably pay phone or something. She calls me, and uh, this is pre-racial awakening, you know, that, that year, George Floyd. So, you know, That's 2017. a little bit of credit, but she calls me and she says, hey, Asha, you, you want to meet for coffee and talk about education and race? And I'm on the other end, and I'm like, who the hell is this? <laughs> um, no preamble. I have no idea who it was, but I decided, look, all right, let's go and see what Allie is talking about again. She was very excited. Don't know if you can tell. <laughs> um, and very we, convincing, too. We decided she was very convincing because I went home and talked to my husband, who's an attorney, and said, hey, I'm not here. My friend Allie wants to write a book with, with me. What, what do you think about that? <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it anyway. Um, and 14 months later, we had a deal with Penguin Random House for our first book, Tiny Confessions. Six months before that book hit the shelves, it was optioned by Netflix um, with Regina King's production company, World of Highs. So let me tell you the shopping we did. <laughs> we, we thought, wait a minute. We got we first middle book? age fabulous. <laughs> it walked a mountain. <laughs> I mean, I just thought it was going to be a whole new life for us, right? And then COVID came. And our dresses are still hanging up in the closet. <laughs> um, Netflix went through a big old crash. They fired everybody, and the person who purchased our option got fired. And the new person was like, "Yeah, I don't want any old stuff." So uh, we, we we got left over on the sidewalk for that. Um, but our agent said, "Too 
back to work, you, you, you got to come up with your second idea. And Allie, the handbreaker, she is, I don't know if I have another idea. Well, to be fair, our debut book, Tiny Imperfections, came out in COVID. It did yeah. well for that time. Um, but then our agent said, does she need to come up with a second book in COVID? I mean, where do we all get our inspiration in life? Being out in the world, right? Meeting new people, observing at the grocery store, at an airport, at a coffee shop, like taking in input from the world around and being a phenomenal listener, not always the talker, is where you get your best ideas. So here our agents is saying, write another book, and it's the pandemic, and Asha and I are looking at each other with no input other than each other and our families, and like, oh my God, what's going on? What, yeah, what's going on? I washed another cornflakes box off. <laughs> I mean, that was about it. But uh, with enough staring each other's faces, we wrote our second book, Never Meant to Meet You, um, which is a loose interpretation of ourselves and our friendships because it's about a black Baptist woman and her white Jewish neighbor, and really their lives do not intersect. But there is a husband that dies, and the two women are thrown together. And, you know, for us, that book, we wrote that book in a really interesting time where there was so much racial upheaval in the United States. And then there was um, a massive rise in anti-Semitism. And we wanted to explore our Jewish and Baptist relationship, but also the Jewish and African-American experience in the United States has been a long um, and supportive one, <laughs> also in many ways a parallel one. Um, and so we wanted to explore that topic as well. <laughs> and I was really interested in exploring grief because that's what we were all immersed in. But that was a little harder for me to convince Asha. I wasn't to sure explore. about that. Um, I wasn't sure if I was experiencing grief. I sort of thought about grief as someone dies and you're grief. You lose a pet and you're grief and then you get over it. But um, through the process of writing this book, I was able to get in touch with the fact that I was grieving. I had two sons, one one who was graduating from high school, didn't have a prom. Um, I had another son who was graduating from NYU, supposed to be graduating in Yankee Stadium. I was going to be fabulous at that graduation. <laughs> Everyone was going to be looking at me. Um, and that didn't happen. So those were, were moments that I, I was feeling great. Um, and we were able to explore that in that second book. But that is an example. Asha and I, as writers, um, I mean, we are so fortunate and we get along so well, and my strengths are Asha's weaknesses and vice versa. But there's a lot of negotiating and that we have to do together. Some of those negotiations and those discussions and those drawn out, um, you know, digging our heels in, but then having to lighten up, come around know race because we're different and religion because we're different but also some of it comes around you know themes and what we're going to explore and i was very convinced that this was a time to explore grief and asha really need this needed to sit with that for quite a bit of time and even begin our writing process and i would say with exploring grief you use the writing process as we move forward through the chapters to become more and more convinced of that theme. I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So um, we also had to negotiate how many times Al was calling me every day. <laughs> <laughs> we still haven't come to terms. <laughs> I get I have a little phone Tourette's. So every time an idea pops in my mind, I have to call Asha. And she hangs up, and then she calls me 35 seconds later. And says, but I'm not going to call again. And then again, she calls. <laughs> so, but that's how we end up with our wonderful books. So now we're at the better half, um, which I'm not going to explain how this came up. We're going to we'll tell the interesting life thread through all of them. But the better half is actually um, a Mindy Kaling imprint. So a year and a half ago, a year and a half, two years ago, she announced that she was going to do a specialty imprint where there would be 
She would do two women's fiction, or really just fiction, I hate the term women's fiction, two adult fiction, and two uh, YA, or young adult fiction. It's only four books a year, and she wanted to champion um, women of color, comedic women, stories that were diverse, and we found out about her imprint on Instagram. And yeah, I called Asha, I'm like, that's us. Like she's described us. Now there's not a direct link from Mindy Kaling on Instagram to getting your book in front of her. So Ali said, let the stalking begin. <laughs> <laughs> I am a very determined one because you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, right? It's gonna be no. But I've always operated that like it has to be yes to someone. It could be us. You never know. And by the time you're in your 50s, like we've heard no enough. I mean, first of all, how many times did you hear no as a PK teacher? Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, no just rolls off our back. So we went um, on the long and circuitous hunt with our editor and our agent and all our peoples. And ultimately, um, after many presentations and discussions, our book was picked up. So we are Mindy's second um, adult fiction book of her imprint, which was super, um, super exciting to have that connection and for someone who is such a comedic and writing force mm -hmm. and has been for two plus decades to recognize that we actually have skill as writers and as creators to, um, and for her to want to push our mission forward because Asha and I really have two driving forces in our writing. Some some authors have a driving force, some don't, we happen to. So one of, one of them is our vision of how we write. From our very first book, from Tiny Imperfections, with Never Meant to Meet You, with The Better Half, Asha and I have always written from the human perspective first. So many people assume, because we have um, protagonists who are black, we have, you know, our, all our characters are mixed race. Oh, well, Asha, you must write the black characters. Ali, you must write the white characters. I must write the Jewish, you must write the Baptist. Not at all. We write first from the human perspective and everything together. After that comes all the parts that make up phenomenal individuals. But that is a unique scenario for how co-authors write. They usually divide everything up, we do it all together. So number one is commitment to write as humans first. That's our vision, our mission for our writing. And this really solidified after Tiny Imperfections came out because it did come out in May of 2020. And there were unbelievable book lists that were put out all over that um, were offering people many amazing stories, some fiction, some nonfiction, to be able to dive into stories of people <coughs> of different communities, people of different races, of different religions. Again, all amazing authors. But what we realized on those lists is that most of them were about people's trauma and drama and very heavy and very hard for some people to read. Not everyone can take on book after book after book of the hardest and most and the most challenging parts of life. And so Asha and I wanted to use our writing to offer an avenue through humor, through joy, through laughter, to look at religions and look at races and look at communities that might be different from ourselves and be able to enter through that uh, lens, and we kind of call ourselves the Will and Grace of Race, because <laughs> what the show Will and Grace did for the LGBTQ community of really just making it a part of our, you know, Thursday, you know, when it was Thursday night lineup TV, and it was great humor, but there was love and joy. We wanted to do that with our storytelling as well. Um, and so that was our commitment with the mission of our writing. Um, I think there's a message out there that I, I've seen, and um, some people operate on this truth, that um, if the dominant 
culture is not uncomfortable and the work is not being done. And I just don't believe that that's true. I think that if you're uncomfortable with something you're reading, you might put it down and not revisit it. And where does that get you? Um, we wanted to provide an entree for people who have the tender heart. You know, and I, I feel emotions and tough stories are tough for me to internalize, um, for me to digest. So I wanted to allow for those readers who maybe needed a little bit of joy, smile, something a little gentler um, when learning these tough lessons. Uh, and I think we've done that really well. Yeah. And it's also interesting in that last point on this that you share what the better half is about. Mm -hmm. But it's it is really interesting when writing um, drama is that regardless of who you are, everyone can agree and shake their head, yes, rape is bad, genocide is bad, slavery is bad, right? Trauma, we can have more agreement. Writing comedy and writing comedy about challenging topics is really hard because not everyone finds the same things funny, how, nor does everyone find how it might be delivered funny. So um, it's really been like kind of a very, you know, threading the needle carefully, excuse me, so that we are embracing and um, challenging at the same time. But we do, in fact, like, I mean, our reviews can be all over the place. Some people think we are the greatest gift to comedy ever. And then we have to share our favorite negative yes. review. Oh, gosh. My very, very favorite, which I, I feel like I might get it tattooed or at least made into a bunch of <laughs> Someone wrote, I read this book, Never Meant to Meet You, should have been called Never Meant to Read You. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I wanted to get in touch with that person and say, you should be a writer. <laughs> that was a good one. So then we we're waiting with our with the better half for someone to say the better half, the worst half. <laughs> I haven't gotten that one yet. Um, but so the better half, Asha, what is this it book is about? about Nina Morgan Clark, a woman in her 40s, who in her mind has arrived. She has done all the right things her life in her life. She's in education, been on the right path, done what her mom and dad told her to do, um, <clears throat> gone after graduate degrees to be hired as the first black female um, headmistress of Story Royal Hopkins School. She has a daughter who is across the country in boarding school and also an ex-husband who's across the country, which is making her quite happy. Um, and before she starts her school year, she and her best sister friend, uh, Marisol, go on a girl's trip. And when they return, Nina returns with a little something extra. And she's in a dilemma about what to do about that little something extra. She was looking forward to this second half of her life being all about her. It's my time. I will take care of my child. I'm taking care of her, but she's over there. She's doing fine. I am about to live. Really put my heart in this world. And as we all know, when we make plans like that, it gets real somehow. And uh, Nina's get a little turned around. Um, there's a little bit of romance coming in her life. Her father is just getting over the death of his wife and finally in a good place in his life. Um, but she's got, at the beginning of the school year, she's got a new hire named Jared Jones. And if you know anything about schools, male teachers are extremely coveted. We need more because boys need representation in the classroom. Black male teachers, diamonds. Schools are running after them because there are so few that having that representation in a, in a school is so important to the, to the classroom, to every child, not just the black male children, but all of the children. So she scored one. She's got this wonder hire in Jared Jones, but he's turning things around, twisting her around a little bit. Now, you have to always remind me of the gem oh layers. God. You like can't say the author. I she can't. Is, she forgets. Nina Morgan Clark is Gen, Gen Z. X. Oh, Jared Jones is Gen Z. 
So there's a little bit of a different lens on what it means to be in the workplace, what it means to be mentored by your boss, what it means to focus on the job at hand. Jared is convinced that he is there to do a job that he wants to do, and Nina has a job that she thinks he should be doing. Um, and so there's a little bit of a butting of heads there. One of the things that themes that drives this book is a quote from uh, Zora Neale Hurston that not all skin folk are kin folk. Um, Nina does not have to be the pillar of black thought and represent the black community all by herself. She, she, she um, wrestles with that a little bit. Um, but at the same time, when you're an only in a community like a private school, when you see someone that looks like you across the room, you're kind of like, hey, there, I got a partner in crime. <laughs> but Jared Jones has his own way of doing things. And where Nina thought she was going to get great support in him, he's got other ideas. So she has to contend with that as well. Um, and at the end, it's it's all kinds of twisty and turny and, and <coughs> exciting. And I, I'll tell you that when we're crafting a story, the beginning, middle, and end, the twists and turns, the tension in the story, that's all Allie. I mean, her poor husband. <laughs> <laughs> what you, you, she's hiding the face, so I don't see the face. She's giving you talking about Scott. Uh-huh. He's got to have the best patience. <laughs> um, because her mind is working. She can see 10 steps down the road and where we need to be at the end of our story. So. We always we talk about our writing. She is the bones of the story. Um, and I'm the meat on the bone. She she depends on me to give those characters some emotion, a voice, a past, a point of view, a perspective, reasons why they are the way they are. Um, she always says she has the emotional depth of a chipmunk. <laughs> um, but yes, I can uh, make our characters cry and laugh and and she factors it all into the story, and somehow it works out. So before we open up to questions, um, we always have to share this because we find this sort of crazy. Not that we're giving ourselves otherworldly powers. However, so with our first book, Tiny Imperfections, we wrote it, and it really revolves around an admission scandal. We turned it into our editor, and our editor was doing the first pass on it. And right when she's doing the first pass on it, the whole uni university blues scandal broke out. And it was literally what we had just written about, but within the context of K-12. And then that broke. And we're like, oh my gosh, isn't that crazy kismet that that happened? Then we went and we wrote uh, never meant to meet you. And as we're writing never meant to meet you and finishing it up about to turn it in is when the anti-Semitism wave really rose in the country. And we had just written a whole story about anti-Semitism and, and what is the anti-Semitism and is it racism? How is it similar? How is it different? Do people really understand it? And right when we turned that in, there was this title in the country. We're like, whoa, that's nuts. So then with the better half, we were writing the better half when there was the first inklings and conversations about uh, Roe v. Wade and the dismantling of Roe v. Wade. And this was long before anyone was talking about it being at the Supreme Court level. We're like, that's never going to happen. But we were really interested in exploring the theme of whenever people really talk about women and their uh, you know, ownership over their reproductive health, they're often looking to women who are young, unmarried, disenfranchised, um, and as, as the you know, single mothers and the decisions that are being made about whether to have or not have a child. There are plenty of women out there in the world who um, are in relationships. They have a lovely home. They have jobs. They have raised wonderful children. 
and they find themselves in a pickle. And they also have a choice to make because they've done the raising of the kids. They've had that part of their life. And that might not be something that they want to give over their entire life from 20 years to 40 years again. So we wanted to explore, um, you know, that questioning that happens for an older woman because it does happen. And then Roe v. Wade went all the way to the Supreme Court. And we're like, oh my God, that is crazy. Because when that happened, it was in the hands of our editor. And then right before the better half launched on July 1st, was when the Supreme Court dismantled affirmative action. And one of the themes in this book is the theme of representation and merit. And how do you rectify or not those two in an academic setting? And we were like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is crazy. So we've written these three books that have really sort of proceeded and then ridden the wave of these large shifts that have come in our country. And we've done it through a humorous lens. On yeah. topics that aren't so huge. I still haven't figured out the Mega Millions numbers. I know, we're trying <laughs> so hard to win the lottery. <laughs> we're not that, we don't have that good at ESP. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so we found, you know, this really sort of interesting ability to feel where, you know, some topics or some mindsets or I, we don't know what, but we <coughs> find it rather curious. Um, so we turned our fourth book in Yeah, a week after this book came out. Oh my gosh, we're so tired. <laughs> I know. A, a week after this book came out, <laughs> we wrote a story about a woman. Well, one of the characters has a stroke. Then my mom had a stroke. It was so and bad. And Allie felt so bad. She was like, I mean, literally, oh we had just I written that scene. your mother. <laughs> oh, my God. We can't say that one in public. Oh, it's still not over that one. I don't know. It's kind of funny. But as Asha said, so we have just turned in our fourth book. But I, And I do like to ask this of our audiences, though. So our first three books, the backdrop have, has really been schools because it is an experience all of us have had. And it is the one of the great places that you can really observe humanity. From babyhood all the way up to grandparent. I mean, mm -hmm. I've taught some kids where I've given their moms a baby shower mm -hmm. and then their kid is in my class a few years later. Mm -hmm. Grandparents day happens in my classroom, mm -hmm. aunts, uncles, nannies, friends, everybody passes through school. So that's the great thing about schools. We have departed for our fourth novel to a different landscape that is a great place to observe humanity. So we like to just see if anyone has any guesses in the audience. Uh, if we're not in schools anymore, but it, we are in a landscape that is an amazing cross-section of humanity. Does anyone have any guesses? Airport. Oh my God! You're the only one that's music. My favorite place to do. Everybody talks about this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's our fun that we've been having since 2017. We would have never guessed that this is where our life would have gone. And we're at Zibby's Bookshop in part because um, during Tiny Imperfections, she was just really <coughs> hitting the scene as a, a um, podcaster, book influencer. People were starting to sit up and notice um, all of the books that she was curating, and she invited us to her home to um, uh, be a part of her podcast for our very first book, very early on in her career. And since then, she's invited us for each and every book. And we're extremely grateful that now that she's in this beautiful bookstore, she's had us here as well. So for sure. Thank you, Zibby's Books. I know. <laughs> so with that, any questions? Yeah, I do. Yes. Okay, so, but um, there might be a little, um, 
like unintended reveal the plot line? Do we not want to do that? You, it's oh, your you question. Can, it's your exactly. Right. So like the whole reveal. school, <laughs> of, um, the school <laughs> setting only because I mean just because we you know I have kids, I know those parents. They mean you and you write the parents so well. And then of course I worry. Oh, was I one of those parents? You know, <laughs> yeah, probably. Of course you were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? We all were. You were. Yeah. <laughs> But the storyline in the better half with the two boys from mm -hmm. the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember, it wasn't Watts, it was Compton. Compton. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the whole thing with Jared, that whole like plot in his head about how that threw me, because I'm like, is this a thing? Like, did you make that up or did that happen? Because that that was that just caught me. That is loosely based on a true story that happened at a private school in the Pacific Northwest. Yes. Was it tell? I mean, was it covered in the media? How did you know uh, that? It was, was covered uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, in the in the media. Yeah. So that it wasn't exactly what happened, but it was loosely based. I mean, the theory was is pretty genius. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you had made it up, but then I thought, like, what a brutal thing to do to someone. Mm -hmm. But, okay, I just love, yeah, I love, your your plot twists are so great. <laughs> and I have to just thank you, too, in that, you know, we're in the book, our book club, and a lot of book endings are just not happy endings. And, and real life, oftentimes, when you listen to the news, they're not happy endings. And so, I so appreciate that you have all these different, really interesting storylines going on in, in one book. And they all speak to you. And then at the end, you sort of, you find a way to tie it together and it's satisfying. It doesn't leave you feeling like, you know, we want to throw the book across the room. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's part design as well and part of our mission. You know, we both come from communities where, it, listen, in high school history, all I learned about Black folks was slavery and the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm few paragraphs here and there. I didn't see myself anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I read about Jewish people was the Holocaust and, you know, escaping. Um, and uh, there's so much more. There's a reason that we're here. And that's because our ancestors were joyful. They knew that life was worth living despite their circumstances. Uh, all that resilience, um, the survivorship, that came from being joyful. And that's why we're here. We wanted to put that out there. And I, I just said the other thing for those of you that have read one or more of our books. It's also been really important to us, if you pick this up, we do have um, romance in our books. And it's getting a little bit more each time as we get better at writing it. We really sucked oh at trying to write it the first time. I've been with my husband since I'm 18. <laughs> 33 years. You think I remember some first kiss? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> so writing about it now. That's like yeah, two me. married women yeah. in their 50s writing about first kisses. But <laughs> within that, we really wanted to write women whose lives were full of love, absent of having romantic love. Their lives were full. They had amazing love of friendship, that amazing love of their careers, amazing love of their family. And the romance that comes into our books, they don't make the person's life. They become a nice addition. So we do have nice endings. You know, it doesn't leave anyone devastated. But our hope is, is that people don't walk away from our endings going, oh, she was saved by Prince Charming. Isn't that great? Prince Charming was lucky enough to enter into this very full life that the protagonist had. And he was bringing something as well, but he was not bringing all of it because she he had was bringing most of it something. Up. Yeah, <laughs> we all need a little Prince Charming in our lives, <laughs> but it didn't make or break her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Is Zippy um, selling your first two books? 
You know, oh, I'm sure question. that you can order through Zibby's bookstore. Okay. Any book that you want to get that's ours, absolutely, they'll get it in here for you. Perfect. Yeah. Any book that you want to get, don't live here. Well, they ship they'll it. ship it. Oh, that's great. Yes. I'm yes, sure. we got a thumbs up. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. You should read all three of them. There, I right? know. I know. <laughs> As an educator, I get it. <laughs> yes, you need to read all three. Yeah. But they're not in store right now. No, um, just the better half is, I believe. Okay. Yeah, yes. So after your husband got a reaction when she called the first time, after four books, how does he feel? <laughs> oh, he's, well. <laughs> <laughs> he does ask me after each book. Um, so you gonna put a little something on the light bill now? <laughs> I will someday. Yeah. I'm getting there. Um, very excited. My number one fan. I, mean, I have posters and prints of all the books all over our house. I'm like, babe, that's enough now. <laughs> um, biggest fan ever. And we have to say both are. We were. We both are. Our husbands have to be fans because now I actually don't live in Seattle anymore. I live in Idaho. And, but we have the commitment, so we obviously are in FaceTime constantly, but once every six weeks, Asha comes to my house for a week, or I go to her house, and we go deep for, you know, like 10 hour days for six days straight. I mean, I am in Jeff's face, <laughs> you know, every six weeks or every three months, like in his house, in it. We have matching pajamas. <laughs> I mean, we are so, you know, same, and same with my husband as well. I, I am not a picture taker at all. So we have Asha's niece and my daughter as we've been doing the Southern California book tour. Asha's sending all the pictures from my trip to my husband. I'm like, I haven't sent him one text. She's like on it. I'm like, oh my God. And we're number one in women's divorce fiction on Amazon right now. So they're like, I got an email from her husband with a screenshot. <laughs> and with, in big letters, what the hell is this? <laughs> are you trying to tell us something? <laughs> People are, we get that a lot from women, even from one of our publicists who's divorced, they're like, are, are either of you divorced? You write divorce so well. <laughs> like, I sure am. So now my husband gets very nervous we're going to kill off the husband. <laughs> <laughs> and he's mentioned that a few times. Do you have an editor or who reads your books before? First, my mom. <laughs> my mom has been our beta reader for all of our books, and she just walks around the house because I print everything out and big prints for her. She's like, oh, no, she did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, look at what this character's doing. Girl, why you give me this book? <laughs> if she acts that way, then I know I'm on the right track. But yes, we have, <laughs> we have an acquisition editor. So the person that you know acquired us into Amazon Publishing um, and still works with us very, very closely all the time. We have a development editor who reads it and says, hey, this is lacking here. You need to beat this up. I don't understand this. Or the timeline's off here. And she's been with us since before we ever had a contract for a book. Yeah, we've used her all through books. Yeah, she's a really, really invaluable member of our team. Um, but you also, in this new world of publishing, if you're not among, especially among the, um, the big five that are very traditional publishing houses, um, and a, a little bit more on the dinosaur end of things, but new publishing houses, including Zibby's Books, but also the, the Amazon imprints that we've been with, they send you out for cultural sensitivity readers as well. Now, before I'm working with Penguin Random House, I was often the only brown person in the room. Everybody's looking at me like, I, I don't know if this is right for all black folks. We need some more black folks in here. Get some more opinions. It's all on me. So it's really great and helpful that they do that. But, <laughs> it's our second book uh, with Never Meant to Meet You. We got a note back from our sensitivity reader that said, ladies, I just wanted to let you know that you used the word crazy 
17 times <laughs> in the first 10 chapters. And some people may be upset about the effect of you know, mental health and your opinions and judgment of that. We kept crazy in there. We, we, we didn't budge on that part. Um, so you have to take what their opinion is of how you're going to be perceived and decide, is this worth cancel culture? Or is this something I need to keep in because it's it's part of my character and my story and will I risk it? I, I will add that what was really interesting to me and was never meant to be used since it was really, even though the black woman was the protagonist, there were really two. Um, and the cultural reader was sent to uh, a black woman in the South. I mean, they wouldn't do so much of this in the Northwest. I took it upon myself to send the book to my rabbi, to send it to a friend of mine who is a very conservative Jewish woman and a friend that's reformed like myself. And there were things that I got wrong um, in the book about uh, a few technicalities about Judaism. And I thought kismet was a, a Yiddish word, and it wasn't. And there are a couple other things in there. And you know, I said to our editor, I said, you know, listen, there was not an offer to send this to a cultural reader who is Jewish, because there's an assumption, oh, well, a Jewish person is most likely white. That doesn't need to be culturally read. And I said, if I had not sent it out, we would have put a book out there with some mistakes around Judaism. As well, a lot of what you get back from cultural readers is opinion. So, you know, and you get a long list. One of us, we have a line in Never Meant to Meet You that, that um, the protagonist says, oh, being a mother of a son is the best thing in the world. And of course she's going to think that. She's the mother of a son. We, there was a line in there. Mothers of daughters might feel really excluded by saying, I'm like, I'm a mother of two daughters. I don't feel excluded, but it gets really, you know, but that's opinion, right? Religion, and when you write about religion, that's that's fact. And you actually have to have some real knowledge. So, you know, I've really pushed that um, if, if publishing houses are going to go the way of the cultural reader, then it needs to be all cultures. And it also, depending on what the purpose is, needs to be people who have some real knowledge in an area. Because God forbid if we put that book out without my rabbi reading it and then my aunts read it, I mean, yeah. I would have been the doghouse. <laughs> I would totally take your spot in the will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was really, and I'll say our editors really listened to that. And they're like, that was a great point. Um, so that was really, that was interesting. Um, so it sounds like you both uh, kind of found your creativity little bit later, right? Um, it's one thing to have a story that is in your head, and it's a completely another thing to publish a book. Um, how did it change in your mind from, like, oh, yeah, this is a story I want to tell, to this is the story I'm going to tell, and then now this is what you do, who you are? Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so a couple, a couple of things, and these are just um, life things. Both Ash and I, I mean, between the two of us, we have 40 years of education. I mean, of teaching and, and being an educator. So we were used to, I mean, particularly when you're an educator, man, you're up, you're at school, you know, at a set time, you're teaching all day. Like, there's barely time to go to the bathroom. No one's going to lunch. No one's going to grab, to grab coffee. So when we were in our mid-40s, um, and we decided to do this. Our lives had been in the routine of like, you get up, you get dressed, you sit your butt down, or not if you're a teacher, but you get to work. And I think a lot that stumps creatives is getting your butt in the chair and get to work. And there are a lot of writers, and we're, and we're not you know, dismissing any of this, but they're like, oh, you know, I'm in a critique group, and I go to a ton of readings, and I'm taking a class on how to write fiction. And all of that is great, but that does not get a book written. And I make the analogy I'm a big runner, 
And, you know, people are like, oh, I gotta get the right watch and the heart rate monitor and research the shoes. And I'll put the shoes on and get out the door. And that first year when both of us were committed to writing, I, I mean, I still, like, I think in the eight years that we've done this, I've gone out to lunch with a friend twice. Like, I don't do lunch. I don't, our writing is our job and we treat it just like we treated it when we were teachers. And that's, you know, how we have three books in seven years. I mean, to be clear, we're tired. Um, but that um, we've already started on book five. Yeah, I mean, it's that's true. Tired. But it's, not that tired. you know, it's ritual, it's ritual and routine. And, um, you know, just like when you go and you run or you exercise, the first 10 minutes hurt and suck, and then your body gets into Every time, I can't speak for you, you know, every time I'm like, oh, I don't feel like sitting down. And I hem and haw and I sit down and the first 20 minutes are hard and clunky and then it just goes. Um, so it's, it really isn't just the doing it and keeping yourself on a deadline. And we're super lucky because um, I make the deadlines and I'm very type A. But I have found a partner who, I mean, I don't know anyone else that can keep up with my personality. Like, Osh is as competitive and into it as I am, so she meets them all. Like, we're really lucky that way. Some partnerships, it doesn't always end up that you have that same personality. But she, you know, we meet every deadline together, and we were both nerdy great grubbers in high school, so we're like, we're going to make our deadline. We're going to get a day. I want a gold star. Yeah. <laughs> and did she just use the phrase, I can't speak for you? Did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She is that right. That was a one and done. Allie, I mean, she will, again, we were talking about the emails earlier. She has an administrator's mind. She will put out our schedule and okay, so this day we'll do this, and then the other day we'll do that. And then you'll call me and I'll call you, and then we'll flip around and do it again. And I'm like, what does she say? But somehow, I mean, I do it because again, I'm not gonna disappoint her as much as she's not gonna disappoint me. And um it's a it's a it's a competitive nature. But it's also just a commitment to my work partner. Yeah. I want to put out the best books. And it's almost like, again, it's like a marriage. If you're not on the same page and you're raising your kids, you're going to turn out to be pretty kids. <laughs> um, we have to be on the same page so that we turn out the best books that we can. And I would say that's where our mission and our vision really helps. Like We know what we want to put out into the world. We have this bigger mission. Um, and I think that really helps us work through like the icky parts as we go, because, you know, everyone's trying to find their good little piece that they can put out into the world and hopefully make it a little better. And this is, you know, the avenue that we've found. Um, and it would be a lot harder for, at least for us as an individual writer, because we have the accountability. And can you tell we're chatty? Yeah. <laughs> I think both of us just discover. I mean, I've written on my own. Allie has written on her own. This is so much better. Um, having feedback right away about your ideas. Uh, I think I'm going to do this, this, and that. No, that's terrible. <laughs> that's helpful. So I don't go down that road. Um, bouncing the ideas off each other, but also feeding off that energy, the excitement to get through the project. I have a partner who's guaranteed to be as up for the work as I am. I'm going to say one more thing that we're going to let you all go is that, I mean, this is just a really honest answer. I don't know that I would be as interested in being creative. I mean, we've Let me back and say our fifth book that we're starting to think through is our protagonist is white because we haven't like shown that we can write a white protagonist. We can All do white ours. people too. <laughs> <laughs> and but it's interesting to me, like I'm not get that interested in her. I'm much more interested in learning and exploring people different than I am. She actually says, Oh, 
writing about a white woman, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Allie, that's low key racist. <laughs> 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 but I think it's because with every book that we start and every characters that we start, to always have that beginner mindset. Our fourth book that we just turned in, um, our protagonist is Afro Puerto Rican. And <coughs> it's been so fun exploring a whole different culture. We went after it with a beginner mindset. And there's a strong um, South Asian character in it. Like that's been so awesome. So it's also, um, you know, a lot of people like to say, like, oh, I'm an established writer. Every book that we write feels like a brand new experience because we like to learn about new and different people and bring them, bringing them into our into our worlds. We have a lot of imaginary friends. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers are always pushing lifelong learning, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, the writing process is that for sure. Wait, should we release these four things? <laughs> what? They're having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> I know, Prude is the whole gorgeous bookstore. And we're happy to sign. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You both have that. Yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'll go out.